Um, my name is Ted Hohola, and I come from the Pueblo of Isleta, which we all know is seven lucky minutes south of Albuquerque, <laughs> which is our brand. And uh, thanks to urbanization, Las Lunas, Facebook, and all of those, it's now more like 20 minutes to uh, Isleta, so urbanization is caught up with us. But anyway, I'm uh, with the Community and Regional Planning Program, and faculty and also director of the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute. And we've been really, really fortunate and also extremely exhausted in terms of having um, been co-sponsor of the Creative Leadership, uh, Placemaking Leadership Conference, which I think some of you may have attended last week. And um, much to our dismay, our guest speaker was not able to come for the actual event itself, but we were really fortunate in order to cajole him to come at this time instead. So we benefited from uh, the ability to be able to um, make him guilty and come after the fact in order to share his uh, prospectus on what is happening with Art Place America. So just a little bit of background um, so that you know where he's coming from in terms of his experience. Um, he's now currently the executive director of Art Place America. He's been in this capacity since January of 2014. Previously, he served as chief of staff at the National Endowment of the Arts <clears throat> and at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. He provided strategic counsel at the Agnes Gunn Foundation served as chief of staff to the president of Columbia University, where he said he burned out after nine months. This is like- No, he did not say that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> and um, has worked in fundraising at the Museum of Modern Art and the New York Philharmonic. His past nonprofit affiliations have included, have included Art 21, the Here Arts Center, the Foot in the Door Committee of the Mersey, Cunningham Dance Foundation, and studio in the school's associates committee. And Jamie currently lives, works, workshops, and plays in Brooklyn, New York. So without any further delay, uh, let me introduce to you uh, Jamie Bennett. Thank you so much. So the only thing I need to correct for the record is that the, conjol the cajoling consisted of Michaela sending me an email and saying, can you come? So that's all it took. Um, but it's really great to be here. And do we want to turn the lights down a little bit, I think, just so it will put you all to sleep, um, but it will also allow you to see some of the images that I have to share. Um, so what I thought I might do with our roughly 60 minutes together, 55 minutes together, um, is share a little bit about the framework and the philosophy for um, how we do the work we do at Art Place America. Share with you some examples of what this work actually looks like on the ground, and then leave sort of the last 15, 20 minutes of our time together for a conversation and discussion, since we're in such an inviting and intimate room. So I always loved coming to architecture and design places who think about how people gather in the space and have a very intimidating wall of seats that I can look at. Um, so uh, as I'm kicking off, I thought it might be helpful to share a little bit of brief history that's, I think, important to the understanding of this work. And so when I talk about a brief history, I want to start about 400,000 years ago, right? And that's the moment that human beings first harnessed fire, right? And that's the moment that human beings extended our day. And I believe that that's also the moment that art and culture was invented, right? So if you think about sort of pre-fire life, Human beings woke up, we did what we needed to do to stay alive, and then we went to bed. But at this moment, we extended the day, and there are a couple of sociologists and anthropologists who studied traditional cultures and mapped the differences between the daytime and nighttime conversations. And daytime conversations tend to be transactional. They focus on things that need to get done, right? Nighttime conversations tend to be rooted in story and gossip. Right? That is the stuff of arts and culture. And the reason I want to start this conversation there is that I believe that was a moment that a division was created 
between the important stuff that we need to do as human beings, the daytime activities, and the stuff that we can do as long as we've got a couple extra hours before we go to bed, arts and culture. And what this work is, what we're here to talk about, is the bringing together of that daytime activity and that nighttime activity, and weaving arts and culture back into the work of community development. So it's not that we do the hard work that we need to get done, and then if there's time left over, we can put a bird on it. Instead, it's really about enlisting the knowledge, skills, and ability that artists bring to the table alongside planners, alongside traffic engineers, alongside real estate developers. So the organization that I'm lucky enough to run is an organization called Art Place America. We're a 10-year fund, so we will culminate our work at the end of 2020. And what we're positioned to do is to, is to make sure that arts and culture is positioned as a core sector of community planning and development. And what I mean by that is that any time a mayor seats a conversation about the future of her community, we want to make sure that arts and culture is there at the table alongside housing, transportation, community safety, and all of the other sectors that are regularly gathered. Why do we want to do that? We want to do that, A, because I've never found a healthy, equitable, or sustainable community that doesn't have arts and culture as a part of it. Two, I've never found an arts and culture sector that can thrive without the support of its community. And three, our communities all benefit when all of the sectors are working together in a shared vision for what our tomorrows might look like. So that means necessarily that we're involved with cross-sectoral conversations, conversations between arts and culture and community planning and development. And as I've spent the last five years traveling around the country, one of the things I've discovered is that I need to unpack what I mean when I say arts and culture. Because most Americans, when I say that phrase, arts and culture, all they hear is travertine marble and toe shoes, right? I say arts and culture, and I mean the full spectrum of creative activity that we do to communicate richly to others. But most Americans hear museums and ballet companies. Right? When I'm in rooms like this, I'm guessing that folks who are gathered here consider ourselves in some way part of the arts and culture sector. How many of us sort of have an arts and culture identity? Yeah. So you guys, this is not surprising. But there's another unpacking of the sector that I think is important. And here's where I'm borrowing from our colleagues at the Center for Performance and Civic Practice. They talk about three different types of artistic practice. Studio practice, social practice, and civic practice. And the two things that change as you move along this continuum are who decides and who executes, right? So in studio practice, an artist decides what she wants to do and she doesn't. She writes a book, she paints a picture, she makes a dance, right? In social practice, an artist decides what she wants to do, but she can't complete the project without working with members of the community. And in civic practice, Artists and non-artists together decide what they want to do, and together they make it happen. The reason that I spend a little time on this is that this is meant, this was intended by our colleagues at CPCB, to describe an ideal arts ecosystem. We need all of these kinds of activities. But many of us, and I will name myself as perhaps the most guilty, use this incorrectly as a good, better, best. So I spent a decade of my life working at the Museum of Modern Art. I was firmly seated on the studio practice end of the spectrum, and I felt really bad for those poor artists who had to work in community, because I just knew if they were a little bit better, they could end up at a museum, right? That's wrong. I showed up at Art Place five years ago, and I'd gone a sort of 180 transformation, and I kept thinking about my poor colleagues back at the Museum of Modern Art who didn't have a window, who never read a newspaper, who didn't know there was a world outside their white cube, right? But in reality, we need Guernica, and we need the work that Fiesta Gates is doing on the south side of Chicago. We need all of these kinds of activity, and it's important to pay attention to the intentionality behind it. The other reason I lift it up is that what's at stake changes. And a lot of visual artists in particular who do civic practice and social practice work follow in the tradition of Joseph Boys, who talks about social sculpture. And there are many wonderful things that that framework brings to us. But one of the problems I've found with it is that it posits community. It posits people. 
as art material, right? So I could work in clay, I could work in tempera, or I could work in community. But community is very different than an art material. We're real people with real lives and real things are at stake. If I'm doing a civic practice project and I get it wrong, people could get evicted from their homes, right? People could be displaced from neighborhoods they've been in for generations or even centuries, right? So paying attention to the stakes and the ethics that change as you move around that continuum are very important. So then that brings us to the community development side of things, right? So in order to unpack the world of community development for the arts and culture sector, we came up with a list of 10 systems of community planning and development that exist in almost every community, right? There are people who wake up every day and think about agriculture and food, economic development, education, youth, the environment, health, housing, immigration, public safety, transportation, and workforce development, right? Funding streams follow, policy follows, universities organize, teach it, organize classes like this. And across the top, you see the kinds of people who do this work. They're the civic, social, and faith-based players, houses of worship, the Elks Club. They're the commercial entities, small businesses, major industry. There's the government, local, county, regional, state, federal. There's the nonprofit sector, and there's fully improving. And the reason we laid it out like this is that I was raised Roman Catholic, and bingo is very important to my people, right? <laughs> so we think of this as the community planning and development bingo card that we're offering to the arts and culture sector, and the idea is to make a partnership that fits in every square. So whether you're a mosque that's working on food security or you're a community foundation that's investing in workforce development, we think there's a powerful partnership to be made with arts and culture, right? So we understand the arts and culture sector, what I mean when I say that. We understand the community planning and development sector and what I mean when I say it. And that brings us to this phrase, creative placemaking, that's often used to describe our work. And that phrase, was first introduced in the United States in 2010 in this white paper that was published by the National Endowment for the Arts. And one of the things that I've discovered as I've traveled around the country is that people hear this phrase differently depending on the background that we bring to it. So many of us in this room, I'm sure, have our own dog-eared copy of Jane Jacobs' The Death and Life of Great American Cities, right? So those of us who've read this book hear the placemaking half of that phrase and understand that what we're talking about is community planning and development that begins with the resident. It's human-centric. We begin with people. People live our lives holistically. We live our lives in a continuum. We can't solve problems in silos because we don't experience life in silos, right? And that work is locally informed. It doesn't look the same in Albuquerque as it does in Phoenix, as it does in San Diego, right? And all we're doing with the addition of the creative is inviting artists to join their neighbors in working in the tradition of Jane Jacobs. But what I've discovered is that many more people, and in particular mayors, don't own a copy of this book, but instead own a copy of Richard Florida's The Creative Class. And I'm going to do a slight, but not entirely incorrect disservice to Professor Florida and give you my definition of the creative class argument which essentially goes there are 100 shiny, happy people who exist in the world. They are the creative class. Every mayor's job is to be in competition to get the greatest number of those people to move to her city. And whichever mayor does that is declared the winner. And as a reward, she gets a Starbucks, a bike share program, and a couple of gay people, right? That's not what we're talking about. This is not a creative class conversation. This is a Jane Jacobs, Holly White conversation. How do we work with our neighbors? So, why do we need arts and culture in the community planning and development conversation? There are three things that I found are helpful ways to begin the conversation. The first is thinking about the fact that most art is still consumed in time, in real time, in real place, and with other people. And in the language of planners, that's foot traffic. Right? If we want to get people to move somewhere, you offer them something to do together. 
And why do you care about foot traffic? You care about things like community safety. Eyes and feet on the street lead to safer communities. And you care about things like local economic development, right? I buy uh, dinner with my friends before I go to see a theater performance. We go out for a drink after the gallery opening. I buy a newspaper and a bus ticket on my way to rehearsal, right? So moving people around is a good thing that those of us who think about communities and community planning care about. The second reason is that artists and the arts and culture sector help root us in place. The Knight Foundation partnered with Gallup, the national polling organization, to ask people what makes them feel at home in a community, what makes them identify a community as their home. And the top three drivers of community attachment across communities of all sizes, and shapes, geographies were social offerings, something to do, openness to new people and new ideas, and aesthetics, how stuff looks. Well, social offerings, openness, and aesthetics are art and culture. So art and culture connects us and roots us in the places that we call home. The third thing that arts and culture does is it helps connect us with our neighbors, right? There's an amazing anthropologist who works at the Field Museum in Chicago called Alika Wally. And Dr. Wally was studying the informal arts, the kind of arts and culture that's likely to be a part of our everyday lives, right? Singing in a choir, uh, performing in a, 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 working in a quilting bee, doing that sort of everyday activity. And what Dr. Wally discovered is that the process of doing art together creates a master identity that's actually durable beyond the art experience. So people who do art together create a bond that transcends race, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, country of origin, gender. And what she posits is that it actually offers a way to integrating communities that don't involve assimilation. So she was looking particularly at musical circles and people from different cultural backgrounds performing music together. And what she discovered is that I could care about polkas from my Polish tradition, care about the accordion. My colleague from Argentina could care about accordions because of the tango. We're each reinforcing our own unique cultural identity. And in the process, we're also creating a new third identity of bond between us. So arts and culture can move people around a community. It can root us in place, make us feel attached to our homes. And it can connect us with our neighbors. Right? So all of that is pretty good, but the grand slam argument when I'm talking with mayors, when I'm talking with civic leaders, is that artists are the one asset that is already present in every community. Right? Not every community is lucky enough to be on a waterfront. Not every community is anchored by a major university. Not every community has a system of strong public transportation. But every single community has people who sing and dance and tell stories. So if the asset is there, and it can do some of the good work of community planning and development, moving people around, rooting us in place, and connecting with our neighbors, why not include the arts and culture sector in the community planning and development conversation? So how do we do that? In order to do that, I've borrowed some language and some thinking from our colleague Liz Lerman who's an extraordinary dance maker who's currently a professor at, the, at uh, Arizona State University. And Liz is involved in a project that she talks about as creating an atlas of creative tools. And in order to do that, she's unpacking the hidden rigors of artists, right? So in order to do this work, she thinks that there are things that artists are good at that are also useful in other situations but are not always instantly recognizable, right? And so the example I give is anyone who's been working in cities, anyone who's been working in planning, cares a lot about rapid prototyping, right? How do we try something out, get instant feedback, iterate, try a new version, get more feedback, and keep going, right? And people who are thinking about cities are desperate to figure out ways to do rapid prototyping. For 5,000 years in the theater, we've called that rehearsal. Right? <laughs> Theater artists know how to do rapid prototyping because it's a core part of what they do in their practice. So our colleagues at the Cook Inlet Housing Authority in Anchorage, Alaska, had a new design for an apartment that they wanted to share with the community. So they actually hired a set designer 
and invited the set designer to make a one-to-one -one scale model of what that new unit would look like. And they could do it for you know, 50 bucks with a couple of two by fours and some Luan. And people could walk in and experience reality and give the Cook Inlet Housing Authority feedback on what should be different, right? That's a terrible place for the refrigerator because I can't open the dishwasher door. Why would you put a window there? I'd rather have it over there. And they could actually do rapid prototyping using the tools of a theater artist. So we're at a university. We all like frameworks, we all like philosophy, but what does it look like in practice, right? So let me give you a couple examples of what this work looks like around the country. And in order to do that, I wanna share with you sort of the four body parts of how we talk about a project, right? When you're doing this sort of work, we wanna root people in their geographic community. Many of us are part of many, many different communities. Communities of aspiration, communities of affiliation, all sorts of communities. For, but for the purposes of this work, we're talking about a group of people who live, work, worship, and play in the same place. Draw a circle on a map and talk about all of the people who live there. I then want you to go back to that bingo card and think about some change related to one of those sectors that you'd like to see. What is a problem with housing that we need to solve? What is an opportunity around transportation that we need to seize? What is a narrative with community safety that we need to change? Three is where Liz Lerman comes in. How can artists be allies in helping to achieve that change for that group of people? And four, how do we know whether or not the change is happening, right? So the example I'll start with is a project from St. Paul, Minnesota. And St. Paul and Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, have a great light rail system. Lower Town is a neighborhood in St. Paul that was not on the light rail system, and they decided to include it. So they decided to design and build the Green Line extension. Now that the Green Line is open, it's a fabulous asset. But has anyone ever lived near transportation construction? Right? Those 18 months are terrible. They're noisy, they're inconvenient, they're disruptive. So what a local group called Springboard for the Arts did is they worked with 600 local artists, 600 artists that already were in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they trained them how to self-produce and how to partner with community organizations and small businesses. And then they sent them out and said, do whatever your art practice is. We just want you to do it along the construction corridor. So over 18 months, those 600 artists produced 150 different events that range from a jazz concert in a Thai restaurant to a dance lesson in an insurance company parking lot to a stained glass installation on a construction fence. And then they used essentially the equivalent of Google Alerts to track what was happening with the neighborhood. How often was Lower Town talked about within five words of traffic jam? And how often was Lower Town talked about within five words of cool thing to do Friday night? And what they discovered is those 150 events produced 30 million positive media impressions. So all of a sudden, this was not a terrible place to live. This is where it was happening. Customers weren't staying away from the local businesses. They were actually showing up for the jazz and hanging out to buy Pad Thai. And most importantly, for the city and for the planners, they didn't spend the 18 months of construction teaching people to stay away from that neighborhood. They spent the 18 months of construction getting people in the habit of coming and going from that neighborhood. So why do I love this project? I love it because it illustrates our four body parts of a project, right? What is the geographic community, everyone who lives along the construction corridor? What is the change we'd like to see? We want transportation construction to suck less. How are arts going to do that? They're going to zip up the neighborhood for everyone. And how are we going to know? We're going to use the equivalent of Google Alerts. I also like this project because it was fueled entirely by local artists, right? No one was flown in anywhere to do it. It was entirely fueled by the people in the community. I also love it because a lot of times when I'm talking with planners and city leaders about, about um, arts and cultural projects, they instantly start thinking about cultural corridors and they start thinking about architecture and construction. This wasn't a cultural corridor. This was an artist district. 
The investment was in people and the investment was in activity. And those investments had lasting change. And the last thing I love about this project is the number of small businesses that have taken their marketing budgets and continue to this day to commission artists. Because it turns out the jazz concert brings in an awful lot more customers than an ad in the penny saver, right? So I'm gonna walk you through a couple more projects. This is one of the projects that's actually featured upstairs in the exhibition, the fabulous exhibition that, that's in the gallery. Um, and this is a project that was fueled by Dance Exchange, a dance company that was actually founded by Liz Lerman that works in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And for folks who don't know Tacoma Park, what you need to know is that Tacoma Park is a first-ring suburb of Washington, D.C. And what you need to know about a first-ring suburb is that the definition of that is a place where thousands of people live and millions of people want to spend as little time as possible because it's just between me and getting to work, it's just between me and getting home at the end of the day. And over the last 50 years, every single decision about the built environment in Tacoma Park was made for the people who want to spend as little time as possible there, right? Streets were widened, stop signs were taken out, speed limits were raised. Every single signal given by the built environment was get out, get out, get out, no one wants to be here. So the people who actually lived in Tacoma Park, the people who were deeply rooted in place, stood up and said, well, wait a minute, what about us? We want something for us too. So the city agreed to redesign New Hampshire Avenue, which is a major thoroughfare in Tacoma Park, and they did it by partnering the local Department of Transportation with Dance Exchange. So why would you connect a dance maker with a traffic engineer? The theory is essentially epistemological. If we bring together different kinds of knowledge, we can produce a better result, right? Traffic engineers are used to thinking about bodies moving through space, but they tend to only think about automobile bodies and tend to try to only achieve efficiency. Dance makers also think about bodies moving through space, but they tend to think about the human body and they tend to think about the quality of that experience, right? So if you bring them together, you can actually design a street that accommodates cars and achieves efficiency, but it also welcomes human beings to linger. The other thing that I think is so interesting about this project is if there's one thing that city government is good at, it's buying a thousand of something. Right? We've identified the park bench. It is the park bench. We'll buy a thousand of it. Everyone will sit on it. Right? If there's one thing that dance makers know, it's that different bodies need different accommodation. So if I want a 70-year-old and a 7-year-old to linger on the same street, I might need to offer them different options. Right? So this is an epistemological argument. So one of the things that we've been doing, because we're going out of... Uh, we culminate our work in 22 months from now, is that we've been trying to organize and sort of harvest the knowledge from these projects. And we're trying to do that by community development sector. So one of the things that we asked our colleagues in the transportation sector are, what are some of the things that are most important to you? What are some of the most difficult things to work on? What are some of the things with which you would like help? And they gave us this list. And what we're now in the process of doing is organizing our projects against this list. So if you think about that Tacoma Park project, what that really is in the words of a, of a transportation expert is making streets safer for all, for all users. If you think about the St. Paul project, what you're thinking about is alleviating the disruptive effects of construction, right? So those are two examples from the transportation sector. Now let me take us to Kivalina, Alaska. Right? I'm gonna go ahead and guess that no one here has ever been to Kivalina, Alaska. Kivalina, Alaska is a 321 Persic Yupik community in the northwest coast of Alaska. If you want to visit it, you have to get yourself to Anchorage and then it's three more flights, right? Just to give you some sense of distance and scale. And if you do wanna go visit Kivalina, go now because in the next seven years, Kivalina will be gone because of sea level rise. This community will literally be submerged, they're a coastal community, and they will be gone. And this community has been trying to relocate itself for about 50 years, and they haven't. And one of the reasons that they haven't is that the residents of Kivalina essentially fall into one of two families. 
And those two families have hated each other for about 11,000 years. So whenever it's time to come to make a decision and to take a vote on what should happen in the community, the vote is one to one, right? And a definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. So the elders did a really smart thing, and they said, we actually need an outsider. We need someone who's not one of us, who's not even from Alaska. We want someone from the outside to come and help us disrupt our thinking, think about these issues in new ways, and reflect our options back to us. So they actually engaged an artist team who are based in Seattle, Washington, and that team has been working with them on sort of a series of workshops that involve getting the community to think differently about what their future options are. So it's an ongoing project. The project that I'll pair it with is a really extraordinary project that's being done by an artist called Aviva Rahmani. And what Aviva's been doing is she's been thinking a lot about contested lands and particularly about lands that the government wants to seize and put things like pipelines on them. And in order to do this, a lot of governments are exercising eminent domain. And in fact, there were some stories that were popping on the news today about eminent domain that's being used in some border communities um, that popped up. And eminent domain is a pretty powerful law, but what Aviva did that I think is really extraordinary is she began researching intellectual property and began researching artist copyright. And she discovered that copyright and IP are actually stronger than eminent domain. And so what Aviva's been doing is she's been traveling around to communities and painting works of art on trees that are on contested land and then getting the copyright to them. And they can no longer use, those communities can no longer use eminent domain to seize that land. I don't believe there's actually been a court test yet, but she has certainly stopped progress and gotten and fundamentally changed the conversations in communities. So both of these projects fall into the environmental sector for us. And when you think about some of the things that the environmental sector has said that they need help with, one of the big things is building community capacity and agency, which is the work in Kivalina. How do we get artists to be organizers, help us think about collective efficacy, help us think about shared visions for the future? And when you think about Aviva's work, it's really about bridging scales. Anyone who's spent more than a minute in the environmental sector at some point has said that we need to think, glo think globally and act globally. And that's exactly what Aviva's doing, right? She's thinking at the 30,000 foot policy level and she's landing it on one very specific tree in one very specific place. So I'd now like to turn to housing, right? This is a project that's building in the lower left-hand corner. That's the building that was designed by an architect called Sir David Ajay. And many folks know Sir David from the work that he did designing uh, the um, African American History Museum in Washington, DC. This is a project that he did in Upper Manhattan and it's 260 units of permanent housing for formerly homeless families. And at the center of that is a museum of art and storytelling. Why would you put a museum of art and storytelling at the center of a building that's providing 260 homes for formerly homeless families? There are two reasons. The first goes back to that notion of foot traffic, right? Without a public space at the center of this building, this building runs the risk of becoming just a place for its residents, right? It's just a place for people who've experienced homelessness. With a public space, you're complicating the pattern of foot traffic in and out of the building, and you're literally connecting the building and its residents with the larger community. The second reason, and what makes this one of my favorite projects in the portfolio, is that the act of storytelling, the act of creating narrative, has been shown to play an important role in trauma recovery. And everyone can understand that experiencing homelessness, particularly as a child, is traumatic. And a definition of trauma is a fact pattern that doesn't make sense. I'm a child living in the wealthiest country in the world, I'm sleeping in a car, I'm eating out of a garbage can, that's traumatic. With storytelling, you have to make sense out of fact patterns, right? You have to synthesize facts 
and make sense of your lived experience. And there's actually a significant body of work that the National Endowment for the Arts has been doing in the Department of Defense with men and women who are returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, where storytelling and music writing are actually being prescribed in the clinical setting at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. So that's a project in New York. Project in Charlottesville, Virginia is called Housing to Home. And this is a project that partners a local arts organization with a local housing organization. And the local housing organization permanently places individuals and families who are experiencing a, a housing emergency or homelessness into a permanent living situation. And what our grant provides and what the arts organization does is it provides a $1,500 stipend to anyone who's moving into a new housing situation and allows that person to commission works of art and to decorate their new place to live in a way that actually makes it a home, right? And if you think about one of the many conditions about living in the sort of poverty that might leave you experiencing a housing emergency, one of the aspects of that is that someone else is in charge of how everything in your life looks, right? If you think about visual equity, I'm sitting in spaces that other people tell me to sit in, I'm doing things that other people tell me to do. I don't, I'm, my agency in many ways is taken away from me. And taking these residents, taking these individuals, and positioning them as people who are commissioning artists to create works of art, who are deciding what they want to look at, who are deciding what will make this apartment into their new home and not simply into a shelter, has really been transformational in that community. So in the word, in the, in the language of, of housing experts, the Sugar Hill Project is nourishing individuals and, and communities who've experienced housing-related trauma, as well as stabilizing vulnerable communities and generating economic development. So you'll see that in the same way, these two projects line up against those. And then the last two projects I'd like to share before we hopefully have a chance to talk a little bit are two projects that have to do with community safety. Right? This is a project uh, that Juxtaposition Arts in Minneapolis, Minnesota is doing. And the individual you see in the lower right-hand corner is one of the two co-heads of this organization, a gentleman called Roger Cummings. And one of the things that Roger and his family experienced living in this neighborhood and working in this neighborhood is that one of the intersections in North Minneapolis had an unbelievably high rate of violent crime. Right? And the, one of the things that was not really a better option than living with that would be thinking about militarizing the streets and thinking about the reaction that the city would likely make if they were to come in and sort of militarize the streets. And so what Roger did is he actually installed a bubble machine on the roof of the building that was at that intersection. And for 24 hours a day, this machine just blew soap bubbles. And slowly, all of the violent crime left that corner. And whether it's because the bubbles were a reminder that someone was watching and paying attention, whether the bubbles were a symbol that someone cared about that neighborhood, or whether the fact that the bubbles just fill people with childish delight and we act more like children and less like terrible adults, that actually used soap bubbles to change the incidence of violence on a corner, right? Now, if anyone here is a policy expert or thinking on the city's scale, you might not be that excited about that intervention because it's likely that that activity just moved to a different place. But if you're one of the families who lives on that intersection, who cares, right? So thinking about the scale at which you're working is very important. And the second project, this is probably the project in the portfolio that's, that's most important to me, is a project called the People's Paper Co-op. Um, that's a project that's being done by the Village of Arts and Humanities in Philadelphia. And before I share the details of the project with you, I want to share just one final framework. And this is a framework that we borrowed from the Design Studio for Social Intervention. And our colleagues at DS4SI talk about the five S's of successful social interventions. They and any of us who've worked on community change <coughs> instantly recognize the first three, right? If you want to think about community change and think about lasting change, you have to think about structure, system, and scale. But I was curious, and I didn't really understand the role of the last two. I didn't really understand why symbol and sensation belonged on this list. 
until I got to know the People's Paper Co-op at the Village of Arts and Humanities. And what this project does is it works with returning citizens. It works with women who've completed their prison sentences and are returning to their citizenship. And the first thing it does is it partners these women with a legal aid organization that gets their records expunged. And that's hugely important to do because if you don't get that done, you can be denied access to housing, you can be denied access to employment, and you can be denied access to benefits. And if the project stopped there, it would be thinking about system structure and scale and it would be perfect and it would be perfectly fine. But the project doesn't stop there because it was conceived of by a couple of artists. So what happens after a woman has successfully had her record expunged is she prints out a paper copy, a hard copy, of what had been her criminal history. She prints out a paper copy of what had been her criminal resume. She herself tears it up, she puts it in a blender, and she makes a literal blank sheet of paper out of what had been this criminal past. And on that piece of paper, she writes an intention for the future. And they talk about these, these works of art as being reverse mugshots, right? They actually talk about an intention and a hope for the future me rather than a fetishization of the past me. And when you think about the role that, that symbol and sensation play in that, when you think about what it means to actually put your hands into a wet vat of paper mulch of what had been your past and get to sort of write your intention for the future, that symbol and sensation attach to the system structure and scale work and really make that project sticky. So, not surprising for anyone who's been thinking about community safety issues, thinking about hot spot policing, so how do we transform liabilities into assets, and thinking about restorative reentry are two of the huge issues that are brought up. And for all four of these sectors, for transportation, for housing, for community safety and for the environment, we've actually published on our website, artplaceamerica.org, four field scans that offer up examples, that offer up these frameworks, and offer up a way for the arts and culture sector to begin working as allies to that specific sector of community planning and development. And what I want to end with, just before we um, hopefully engage in a little bit of conversation back and forth, is a reminder that I'm talking about artists as allies. My problem, however, is that I was trained in fundraising, so I'm good, at, I'm good at sales, right? And a number of artists have come up to me after these presentations and have said, you're overpromising. You're saying that artists can fix things that have been intractable for 10 years, for several decades, for a century, for 400 years since first contact, and that's not fair to do to us. So the reminder I'd like to end this presentation with is this work of ceramics by a British artist called Grayson Perry. And this work of art is entitled, This Pot Will Reduce Crime by 29%. <laughs> so with that, I'd love to sort of adjourn into conversation, hear questions from you, hear uh, reactions, hear corrections, hear things that are sort of useful that we can do in this room together in the sort of 15 minutes that we have left. So we're gonna bring the lights back up and would love to, we can run a mic is probably the easiest thing. So yeah.